Your Excellency, Sri Malai Mishra, uh, dear guest, on the behalf of Antal Yusuf Knowledge Center and Corvinus University of Budapest, it is a great honor to welcome you all on this very important occasion. Uh, we will discuss today the role of India in world politics and international economy. And first of all, uh, because this is an uh, ambassadorial club, it is important also to not only to introduce the topic itself, but to, to introduce the person itself. And let me ask uh, His Excellency Sri Malayan Pisha to, to introduce himself in a way how he became a career diplomat in, in India and, and his way to Budapest, because I think it is a quite important experience for all of us uh, to speak about it, because we often neglect in diplomacy, we only speak about the topic itself, but the persons uh, are very important, we, we can see. And then a lecture will be followed, and after that I have a couple of questions regarding India's foreign policy, and after that, of course, uh, we open the discussion uh, on, on India and on the role of India. So I would, I would like to ask now uh, Sri uh, Malai Mishra, His Excellency, to speak about uh, or introduce himself as a career diplomat and then uh, about the lecture on, on India. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Well, good evening. <coughs> Dean Jisman, a vice rector uh, who has just come, a dear friend of mine. Uh, all of you distinguished gathering, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Joseph Vontal Center, Knowledge Center, uh, my colleagues uh, from the embassy. Thank you very much for inviting me, first of all, uh, to this Diplomats Club. Uh, I don't see any diplomat here from outside, but I trust that a uh, few of you would be studying diplomacy to be eligible to enlist yourself in the Diplomats Club. I am greatly honored today to be invited by this very prestigious center, knowledge center, uh, famous for a very famous person, your very first elected Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Joseph Anthal, who came to power soon after your country became independent and uh, the direction which he gave to this country, the vision which he gave to this country is in a large way being followed to this day. Uh, successive Prime Ministers have come, leaders have shown the way, but I think Mr. Joseph Antal has made a tremendous name in your pantheon of heroes, if I may say so, uh, to guide the way to your national destiny. I was not quite clear about what uh, I had to do uh, the first part of 15 minutes, so I thought maybe I should uh, give you a general broad brush presentation of what India is um, and then come to other uh, specialized subjects which could come by way of discussions, by way of question answers, maybe conversations, I would say, instead of uh, putting it in the very stereotype of a question answer session, maybe we can have informal dialogue uh, between me and others who are here. Uh, I am sure all of you must be in some way being acquainted with India, uh, either through your academic interaction or uh, through your interest, personal interest, uh, or through uh, visits to India or um, impending any kind of uh, project which you may be having, uh, where India comes to focus. Uh, I will just brush through it, just to make you feel that we are now in India. What you are going to see now, uh, is it all India? Uh, 
But before doing that, I must say that today it's a very important day for us in the High Commission because, sorry, in the Embassy, because today uh, I happen to sign on behalf of my government a very important agreement. Uh, it's a memorandum of understanding which I signed with the Ministry of Human Capacities today, uh, which is an education exchange program. Now, an education exchange program opens the doors very wide to exchange between universities of Hungary and universities of India in various ways. And therefore, Corvinus University, of which I am myself a student, uh, I, am, I am a PhD student of this university, by the way, besides my diplomatic assignment. Uh, your universities and our universities will start having a very active exchange program here on. And uh, we are also uh, have a very active scholarship program wherein the government of Hungary is very benevolently giving 200 scholarships annually to Indian students to come and study in Hungarian universities in various disciplines at various levels including graduation, post-graduation, PhD, all the various levels and the government of India in return will give 35 scholarships mostly for language studies studying English, Hindi which are the Indian language Hindi and as well as various other courses in humanities, in sciences and various other areas. In my view, this is a, a landmark agreement which we have uh, signed uh, between our two governments and this gives us a lot of uh, possibility, opportunity for this flow of information, flow of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, sharing of opportunities in intellectual uh, growth of our own uh, selves as well as of our uh, institutions wherever we are through our respective engagements. It's a truism that India is a knowledge power. India was a knowledge power since at least 3000 years of recorded history and the first shot which I am going to show is of Mohenjo-daro. Mohenjo-daro civilization initiated the Indian knowledge civilization. Mohenjo-daro was a place which was on the banks of the river Indus and India today is an anglicized version of people who inhabited on the banks of the river Indus and here you will see what I am saying if you look at Mohenjo-daro see the Indus river just flowing beside Mohenjo-daro and a little up little to the north, another great city of that time was Harappa and Harappa was also equally on the banks of the Indus as well as in a kind of a um, crossroads of different rivers there uh, of Ravi, Sutlej and Indus. You needed rivers to have civilization and I don't have to tell you why because rivers brought fertility to the soil, rivers brought agriculture to the land, rivers brought settlements. And it was there that the earliest major urban settlement was discovered on these particular regions of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, which are in present day Pakistan, but as you know, those days there was no Pakistan. It was all the Asian or rather the Indian subcontinent. Now I will make a little jump. Uh, I come to the reform movements. The reform movements happened in the majority religion of our land which is mistakenly called Hinduism. Actually in any of the Hindu scriptures there is nothing called Hinduism. There is no word written of Hinduism. But why is Hinduism come into vogue? which is the majority religion of India today. It is because, again, an anglicized version of people who lived by the river Sindhu or Indus. The Indianized name of Indus river was called Sindhu. 
and those people who lived by the banks of the Sindhu river were thought to be Hindus because there was some pronunciation uh, problem then and uh, they were generally called Hindus. Instead of calling them Sindhus, they were called Hindus and therefore those who were Hindus professed the religion called Hinduism. Actually this religion is known to be as Sanatan Dharma, which is eternal way of life. Anyway, there were some reform movements within that uh, religion. Uh, why don't you all come in front? There are so many seats. Please. There were two basically, two very important reform movements. One was Buddhism and the other was Jainism. You see here, in this picture, the left side was Gautama Buddha, very, very well known person here. There are people from the Buddhist college here who would better explain who Buddha was, Gautama. And the other picture on the other side is Mahabir Jaina, who is again the founder of this great religion called Jainism. They appeared more or less at the same time in the 6th century BC, both of them, and both of them were princes, they were uh, part of royal clans. Both of them rebelled against the current societal norms, prejudices, and they set up their own values, which was later represented in their own religions. And these were very prominent at the time, which today has a lot of following all over the world. Nalanda and Taksila University is talking about knowledge centers of India. These were important because Nalanda, which was situated on the eastern side of India, and Taksila, which was situated on the western side of the Indian subcontinent, were more or less contemporaneous universities. They were called universities because they had thousands and thousands of students at that time. Nalanda could well boast of 20,000 students and I am talking of 7th century AD. It flourished between 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century ADs. About 350 to 400 years Nalanda University flourished and Takshila was a little ancient to that. It started around 6th century and it also went on for about 200 to 250 years. There were several scholars besides students who lived here because these were all residential campuses with at least 2,000 professors, lecturers in each of these universities. Buddhist scholars who were traveling from other countries to India, they came and studied here. There were a lot of Chinese scholars came and studied here. It was, in a way, the universities which were international in character, which had a whole range of studies, not only religious theological studies, but secular studies as well. A lot of courses on sciences, a lot of courses on medicine, and they all come down from those days of where Mahindradara civilization was, where we studied medicine, astronomy, physics, chemistry, mathematics, uh, town planning, urban architecture, etc., etc. They all were studied in these universities. Incidentally, today in India, the Nalanda University is being rebuilt at the same place where you will see this, uh, where it was earlier. So this is a modern day picture of the Nalanda University as it would look today because it is not yet started fully but we have uh, within our own ministry, which is the Ministry of External Affairs, a division uh, consecrated to this university uh, where uh, we are going to accept scholars from all over the world and this is a project of what we call the East Asia Summit, EAS, uh, which is the acronym for that, which is uh, also being funded by Japan, besides India, Japan, China in particular, they are funding this university also. 
At that time there was flourishing trade and commerce of India with the rest of Asia, West Asia and Southeast Asia. All these links you will see, these are all the trade links. And you see well over, it's crisscrossing all over the continent there. And you will see on the Southeast Asia, going down deep south, nearly touching Australia, uh, Sumatra, uh, skirting Singapore, uh, Sumatra, Borneo, Java, uh, these islands, they were trading with them. And on this side, you can say they were going up, way up to Europe and coming towards Venice and Rome. And all that was a part of later day silk route, what you would say. And the silk route was coming all the way from China. And you will see the silk route also, the, the uh, route in red, which is also uh, mixing with the roots in yellow. And the roots in yellow were basically starting, originating from the Indian subcontinent, while the route in red was coming from China. And they were all going. And uh, to just tell you that commerce and trade were, were very, very uh, lucrative those days. And you can see in the index here, that these routes began from 200 BC uh, and continued through the day and the goods traded were uh, clothing, incense, ivory, metal, precious stones, silk, spices, timber. Uh, there was a lot of wars which happened on our side of the world because of spices. There was a lot of spice trading which happened on the coast of, uh, western coast of India just to tell you how India is a, a composite cultural uh, vibrant society where you have uh, at least nine religions uh, which are seen, uh, which are being practiced, which are being lived today, out of which four were born in India and several others who came from outside to the Indian subcontinent and settled down and became a part of the Indian overall the Indian cultural uh, fabric. First of course is Hinduism, as I told you it was the, it is the majority religion of India and this is one of the very very famous shrines, it's known as Badrinath in the north in the Himalayas and uh, just to give you a sketch that we have about nearly 85% of our national population uh, who have adopted this religion in India. Islam came uh, just a few years, maybe 90 years after Islam was born in the Middle East uh, in the 6th and 7th century AD, as you all know. Islam came with several people who ruled India thereafter. Some came, plundered and went back. Some came to rule. So therefore Islam had many followers. And we have today about 17%, nearly 15 to 17%. Uh, you can say Hindus and Islam, uh, is Islamic people, broadly constitute the national population with the other religions just a little, little part of it. Uh, India's Muslim population is today the second largest in the world. And this is uh, just for you to note that when we say that uh, Muslims are in other countries of the Middle East, in uh, Indonesia, of course Ind Indonesia has the largest Muslim population but India has the second largest Muslim population in the world. This is uh, a Jewish synagogue of Kerala which is in the western part of India. Uh, the Jews, uh, this is the later day Jews, much later but the earliest wave of Jews came to India in the first century AD to the coast of Kerala. Uh, when they were persecuted in, in their own land, they fled in different directions and one of those communities came and landed on the coast of India, on the southwestern coast of India. They built their communities. Even today if you go to this state called Kerala, you will see this synagogue where Judaism is practiced as a living religion. And you have this synagogue in uh, India, uh, quite well uh, established. Christianity came to India also around the same time when it was born here in Europe. And Saint Thomas was among the earliest apostles of Jesus Christ, disciples. He came to India and he settled down again on the Kerala coast. Later on he moved towards the other part of the south and this temple is there for everybody to see. And we have a great 
a cathedral of St. Thomas in, uh, in Chennai, which is on the other side of the southern, southern part of India. And this is just to say that we have a large number of Christian community in our uh, country as well. Uh, we have among the Christians, the majority are the reformists, the Protestant Christians, because of British mostly. Because uh, the Christians who were converted uh, largely during the British rule and therefore Catholics are very few in number. We didn't have many Catholics except for uh, the Portuguese and the French. And Portuguese and the French settlements were very tiny in India, whereas maybe 95% of Indian territory was with the British. Zoroastrianism uh, is a religion of the Parsis. Parsis were the precursors of the Iranian people, uh, the people who originated from Iran. Uh, until the 6th century, this was the religion of Iran. And when Islam came to Iran, they were persecuted and they were thrown out of Iran. So they went also in various directions and one of them came to India and landed on the western coast of India and the Gujarat, on the present day Gujarat and Mumbai, on Bombay coast. So you have a small community of Zoroastrian Zoroastri people who are called the Parsis. The Indianized version is called the Parsis and they live today very, very flourishing community, very business savvy and they are well in the professions in India. They have contributed immensely to national development. Sikhism is the youngest of Indian religions, which was, which was born in the 15th century, where Guru Nanak was the founder of this religion in 1469. And we have this famous temple, Golden Temple, it is called in Amritsar. Uh, it is golden because the temple is uh, completely of gold. And this gold has been contributed by all the Sikh community all over the world. It is a very, very venerated place of worship by Sikhs from all over the world. Uh, the bulk of our overseas Indians, diaspora, uh, are made up of this community, wherever they live. And they are very enterprising and they, they work pretty hard and they have made uh, several communities for themselves abroad in places like Canada, UK and also in America. I have told you about Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism, Buddha, uh, Gautam Buddha was not born in India. He was born in, uh, in Nepal, uh, which is just the neighboring country. Uh, but uh, Buddhism as a religion, by his teachings, flourished in India. And you have several Buddhist monuments, uh, relics of Buddhism, which are found all over India, particularly on the eastern part of India. And uh, later on, it went out of India to uh, countries in the Southeast Asia and East Asia. And now you find Buddhism flourishing in countries like Japan and China. Uh, they all had gone, migrated from India through Southeast Asia to these countries. So Buddhism, uh, it is an irony that Buddhism, uh, though it was born in the Indian subcontinent, it is not as well practiced there as it is in countries like uh, uh, Japan, China, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, Vietnam and other places. I told you about Jainism. This is one of the Tirthankaras. Uh, Jainism has 24 such Tirthankaras, mean great people, great teachers. And this is a very famous uh, um, statue, uh, which is fairly long, uh, height of nearly 57 feet. It's a fairly recent statue. And this is one of the oldest religions in the world with approximately 6 million followers. I told you about the reform movements in the beginning. There has been another reform movement which is called a Sufism. Sufism is a reform movement of Islam. Uh, not many people here would perhaps be acquainted with Sufism. Sufism was also a part of a devotional uh, strain within Islam which believed in no God, which believed in an uh, invisible, absolute uh, God uh, which belonged everywhere. And it, it didn't quite uh, respect the very, very fixed notions of Islam of praying towards one direction, praying five times a, a day, and all those various statues which are laid down by Islam, it didn't, 
It didn't abide by that. It was basically a religion, not a religion, a reform movement, which was based on love, on friendship, on compassion, on sharing. And you have still a large following of this reform movement in India. Many, many uh, big uh, saints, like one, this uh, Khwaja Mohidun Chisti, uh, who has uh, his own resting place in Ajmer, in Rajasthan, in Western India, is hugely visited both by Hindus as well as Muslims. These are uh, worshipped by both religious uh, you know, followers. Of course, you know the great monument called Taj Mahal. I will jump to the British. Uh, many things have happened in between. The Muslim period has come and gone. And now we have the British rule, which transforms to the British Raj. British Raj was for a short period of about 90 years. British Raj came after the so-called uh, Indian Rebellion of 1857, which is deemed to be also the first war, uh, war of independence for, for India. It was called a war of independence because it was fought all over India. Uh, the British have painted it that it was only fought in some parts of India, but it was a national movement. To, to, uh, the first attempt to uh, uh, attempt by way of uh, aggression, by way of fighting the British. Of course, Indians couldn't succeed in that. This is the, uh, the zenith of the British rule, uh, which is a picture at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, where you can see the entire um, uh, Indian subcontinent ruled by the British. They have no challenge here. The whole uh, subcontinent belongs to them at this point of time. And they lived here, uh, they, they made this their, their home, their, their, uh, their largest colony of the British Empire, as you all know, until uh, 1947 when we got independence. These are, uh, we had also a very, very uh, strong, solid spiritual movement and many of you I know are, uh, are uh, familiar with some of our uh, great spiritual leaders. I have just brought in two. Uh, Sri Aurobindo, who has an ashram uh, in, in southern India, in, in a place called Pondicherry, which was ruled by the French, and Swami Vivekanand, whose ashram also is in Kolkata, uh, in eastern part of India. He was a great uh, spiritual person who promoted Vedanta to the world at large. Here I uh, brought in some pictures of uh, stalwarts who, who, who were uh, some of the most important leaders of our freedom movement, which we are fighting then. Of course, topping the list is Mahatma Gandhi, who perhaps you all would be acquainted with, and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, who, who became the first Prime Minister of Independent India. Uh, in this corner is Sardar Bala Bhai Patel, who is the first Home Minister of India. He is a very important uh, lieutenant uh, of uh, Nehru and Nehru and Patel virtually uh, brought in unity uh, to India which was a disparate um, a territory of many principalities and a small union of India but Patel was the one who with a very iron hand who brought all these principalities together uh, and you have on the right side Maulana Abul Kalam Azad who was the first education minister of India who gave, who laid the foundation of Indian education, modern education, who set up the, who was, who was instrumental in setting up all our national universities, all our institutions of technology, all our institutions of management. So he was the person who gave the direction to Indian education, you can say. Uh, in between was Sarajit Naidu, who was a great uh, active freedom fighter, just to tell you that even our freedom movement, uh, women participated as much as the men and they sacrificed as much as men. They were always at the forefront of the battle against the British. This is an iconic scene of uh, the Dandi, famous Dandi march of uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, where he goes and picks up a lump of salt uh, from the sea coast in Dandi of, in Gujarat and that has, uh, that electrifies the freedom movement and that brings in a call for quit India to the British after this, uh, where he says this is the battle of right against might while holding this lump of salt. Gandhi had, uh, had uh, thought of having Nehru as 
uh, his uh, political successor uh, and he had uh, nearly appointed Nehru uh, as the first Prime Minister of independent India, though at that time there was another person by the name of Jinnah uh, who was later to become the father of Pakistan uh, who was also vying to be the first Prime Minister of undivided India. But it couldn't be because there was a partition which came about and we have, this is Jinnah, this is Muhammad Ali Jinnah who was a very very promising lawyer. Uh, he, he founded this All India Muslim League uh, in 1913 and until uh, Pakistan's independence which happened a day before India's independence on the 14th of August this league was in operation and after that it went across to Pakistan and while the new state of Pakistan was created Mr. Jinnah was the first leader of that uh, country he didn't live long he, he was suffering from cancer so he died soon after what happened then when we got independence was this huge partition of our Indian subcontinent where nearly 15 million people were displaced from across the borders uh, which led to uh, nearly 1 million people being slaughtered. Um, uh, that was a communal uh, war at the time where the Hindus and Muslims were blindly killing each other. Uh, it was one of the greatest catastrophes of humankind ever. India at the time of independence, uh, this is the map I am showing you. Uh, you can see in green West Pakistan, which is Pakistan, and East Pakistan, which is today known as Bangladesh. It was the eastern part of Pakistan in 1947. Bangladesh was born in 1971, following again a bloody war between West and East Pakistan. And thus, Bangladesh came into existence from 1971. It was on both sides of India, these two parts of Pakistan. They were artificially created on the basis of religion. And at the time, Indians were told by the British that uh, you have to divide because the continent has to have a partition on the basis of religion. And they gave us this very spurious theory of two-nation rule and the two nation was one Muslim nation and one Hindu nation. Of course, this did not stand to test because in 1971 another Muslim nation broke out and became a separate nation called Bangladesh. Now I will come to the modern day story of India which will perhaps interest you more. Uh, India is marching ahead. It is one of the most promising investment destinations in the world today with a uh, GDP growth of 5.6% uh, uh, and it is poised to grow even more uh, because we were suffering when the whole world was suffering, when Europe was suffering because of your recession continuously for several years. Uh, you have also gone through several stresses. Those stresses were also a part of our economic uh, uh, you know, scenario and we suffered also. Uh, however, today India at purchasing power parity stands to be the third largest uh, GDP in the world with 7.2 trillion uh, US dollars and at current prices the 10th largest economy in the world. I have shown three countries who have engaged with India within the last 3-4 months uh, following the new government of uh, led by Prime Minister Modi. Uh, Prime Minister Modi went to Japan, visited Japan and Japan at the time has promised uh, investment of 35 billion US dollars uh, largely into India's infrastructure sector uh, in the railway sector and I'll show you a slide of railways various features we have China which came the president of China President Xi uh, he came to India some time ago and uh, China promised a loan uh, perhaps a kind of a investment uh, um, assistance or loan whatever you can say of 20 billion dollars then Prime Minister Modi went to USA, uh, this was just about a month ago, where uh, the US government has also promised over the next three years 41 billion US dollars. This is not the end of the story. Uh, he just finished with a very, very important tour of, uh, of the Pacific, where he visited Australia and also before that Myanmar. And uh, Australia and India are poised to grow even more 
because he was visiting Australia, Indian Prime Minister, after 28 years uh, to Australia, and there was a lot of uh, lot of bonhomie, lot of. Uh, uh, closeness evidenced during this visit which will emanate in a lot of uh, uh, agreements in various sectors including the nuclear development sector also. Now certain sectors of the, just quickly, heavy industry, we have uh, uh, second largest steel production, third largest coal production, fourth largest refining capacity of oil and fifth largest producer and consumer of electricity in the world. Railways is uh, one of the largest sectors we have, one of the world's largest networks with over 64,000 kilometers of railway track. 19,000 trains operating daily, carrying 12,617 passengers train uh, and 23 million passengers daily uh, commuting. Uh, Indian Railway is among the cheapest in the world uh, because we have to have affordable uh, transportation system to our people who cannot afford to pay uh, more. Of course, we have a very solid uh, air network also with a lot of uh, uh, air uh, companies um, traversing the Indian skies. But apart from that, our uh, transportation is largely dependent on railways and to some extent on roadways as well. Uh, railways now, we have got 100% FDI uh, there is no cap on FDI, 100% FDI. Uh, so uh, we are poised to getting uh, at least 100 billion uh, FDIs uh, over the next five years into Indian railway sector. High tech, nuclear, we have 20 nuclear uh, plants across India. We generate 4.8 gigawatt of uh, electricity out of nuclear like you like Hungary does produce electricity out of nuclear power, we also do. Um, we have several uh, institutions like IIT Bombay. IIT stands for Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, we have nine such IITs all over India and this is one of the leading institutions for nanotechnology and nanotechnology is, um, is very famous. They have very many collaborations. I'm just telling you because maybe through your knowledge center you could uh, perhaps uh, uh, glance through the picture of Indian universities, what uh, is, uh, what is uh, best uh, which you could perhaps avail of these opportunities. And you can check the websites and find out. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, we have nearly 500 universities in India currently, um, central universities, state universities, deemed universities and all that. Uh, our skilled manpower, we are uh, we are a young nation with a demographic dividend because 50% uh, of India's population is below the age of 25. And today's India's population stands at 1.25 billion people and half of them are below 25 and 65% of them are below the age of 35. So this is a great asset for us in India and we feel that if we skill them we, if we develop the skill, skill building, we can generate a lot of uh, revenues into our economy as well as export the skills to outside countries as well. Because many of the countries in Europe, in Japan, in China, in other countries, many of the countries have a, a declining population, have a, have a declining dividend or an aging population. And uh, after some period of time, as India's uh, growing strength will be its young population, exportable skilled population. There will be many countries in the world which will have to import skilled labor from countries like India and we are ready for that. Agriculture, uh, we have moved a uh, lot beyond uh, our traditional methods of agriculture. Now we are going into a third phase of revolution, what we call the green revolution in agriculture. Uh, this is ongoing now. We have used a lot of uh, modern day technology in agriculture because basically our bulk of our labor force comes from the agriculture sector. Though agriculture uh, as a sector does not contribute that much to the national uh, output uh, for obvious reasons, but agriculture is still the major means of livelihood for India and for Indians. And our, uh, our strength still lies in the villages, in the rural sector, where the bulk of agriculture happens. 
Biotech is a very uh, promising field now and India is going very strong in biotech uh, research, training, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, developing uh, the total industry size. Uh, uh, last year was 4.3 billion US dollars, but it is growing at the rate of 15.1% um, every year. Uh, so we are very potential, uh, expected to increase to 11.6 billion by 2017. Manufacturing, uh, India's manufacturing sector is going slow uh, for reasons that uh, there is less of uh, capital, uh, both uh, 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 domestic as well as overseas capital coming into this manufacturing sector. We do have a big uh, industry. Uh, which is our local industry. We do have a big market, but we need to have more capital inflows into this sector because this is a very important sector uh, for us and the present government is giving a lot of emphasis on growing this sector, manufacturing sector. This would be concerned, uh, you would be most concerned with this. This is higher education. Uh, you can see that we have the third largest education system in the world with uh, 42 central universities, 275 state universities, 130 deemed universities, 90 private universities and 33,000 colleges. Uh, we still have to go a long way because though we have a huge uh, corpus of universities and students, uh, our uh, university education also is undergoing transformation at this time. Uh, we are not very much in the world's top universities still. We would like to share experiences of the top class universities of uh, America and UK and other countries. And there is a process of exchanges going on uh, among the students and faculties of very many big universities uh, like Harvard, uh, to come to India, to establish campuses in India, and we are open to that. Of course, uh, it's an emerging IT superpower. Uh, Hungary also, you have made a lot of strides in your own country in developing this sector. I think this is a good sector for both our countries to develop together, to exchange our, our potential. Uh, both our countries have tremendous potential. And the fact was that three of our uh, top IT companies are in Hungary today, uh, who have invested in Hungary. Uh, and that goes to show the strength of Hungary, of your skilled IT manpower which you have. Space, uh, we have built our own space station from which we launch uh, uh, objects into space. Uh, in 2013, our uh, Indian Space Research Organization launched the Mars Orbiter Mission. And that created history because uh, it reached the Mars orbit in September 2014. And it was purely indigenous, this orbiter. Uh, it was, uh, it cost around 70 billion uh, US dollars, the entire machinery. And our uh, Prime Minister mentioned that uh, it was less than one of the uh, Hollywood pictures uh, made, uh, uh, I forget the name of that picture. What picture was that, Natishan? Gravity. Uh, Gravity. Huh? Gravity. 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 He said uh, the, the Hollywood film Gravity was made at a, at a higher cost than the Mars Orbiter which went to Mars and which... Uh, <laughs> so, and this was purely at indigenous uh, built and of course, uh, how do you compare Orbiter with uh, Gravity? Our defense sector, we are the seventh largest defense budget in the world. Defense also is a very promising sector. Uh, and uh, here the government has uh, increased the cap, uh, the FDI cap to 49%. Between India and Hungary, we have a very strong defense cooperation. And we have several Hungarian companies who are doing business in India and uh, exporting their, uh, their uh, parts, equipments. Um, and uh, other things also they are uh, kind of uh, uh, providing to the Indian defense industry. It is a growing sector for us bilaterally. 
DRTO is basically the, the, the think tank part of the defense industry, a defense research development organization. It has a network of 52 laboratories. Here also we can exchange our strengths between our DRTO and your uh, similar body in Hungary. And we have had successive uh, delegations from India and Hungary exchanged. They visited both countries. They have picked up the best technologies which are available, which could be which could be shared, which could be manufactured jointly, and many of these researchers are coming out jointly into this sector. Medical tourism, uh, medical tourism, both uh, this is a traditional which consists of basically Ayurveda because we are also known for our wonderful Ayurvedic uh, spas and resorts and it's one of the fastest growing segments in India. And all of you I'm sure must be familiar in some manner with Ayurveda, which is one of the most important traditional medicinal um, qualities and exports of India. Uh, here we have our Western medicine system and that also contributes handsomely to the uh, Indian uh, economy. Uh, both together comprise a medical tourism part where at least uh, 200 to 250,000 people uh, annually are visiting India for enjoying this kind of facilities because these facilities are coming quite reasonable uh, cost wise and they can while getting treated they can also save some money to go around uh, looking at various parts of India as tourists and therefore we call it medical tourism. I think in Hungary also you are about to develop this kind of a system. Pharma, we are one of the most important pharma sectors now in the world. Uh, world is third largest in terms of volume. We produce a lot of generic medicine. Uh, generics because we can always, after 20 years, as you know, the patent system goes away of the branding, branded medicines. So after that we can manufacture the same medicine and make it much more cost effective for our Indian market. And these are exported in bulk to various countries, uh, mostly to US, UK, and various other countries. Our savings is very impressive. We have 35% of our GDP in savings uh, because that is thought to be the, the core aspect of our, of our growth. Because unless you have proper savings, you really can't have growth. Because uh, savings will fuel the economy uh, to move further. So you need to have, I believe in Hungary also, you have a high rate of savings now, uh, which is very important for developing economy. And uh, one important thing is our remittances, which we get from our uh, diaspora, our non-resident Indians uh, who are living abroad. 75 billion US dollars we got last year. And India is the largest recipient of foreign remittances by the diaspora in the world. Uh, we get more than even China. The Chinese diaspora is much larger than Indian diaspora. Our diaspora uh, sends money much more to India than the Chinese diaspora. We are a huge market uh, with a 400 million strong middle class consumer class mm -hmm. and therefore our industry uh, which, which has both good and bad uh, sides, good because our people are always uh, happy that they have got a uh, ready-made uh, market for themselves. They are not looking much for an export market unlike countries in Europe who, are, who have to depend on their exports. We really do not depend on exports but the bad side is that they become very complacent and many of our industries then just go out of business because in this era of stiff competition many of our industries cannot stay uh, properly because uh, they do not innovate more. So now the thrust of our government is more on innovation bringing out uh, you know, uh, pouring more into research, development, innovation, so that we become more productive. The productivity part should increase in the world for Indian products. Well, our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, who is the present Prime Minister of India, and he has gave, made some uh, very important, uh, you know, elements of his government. Uh, democracy, demography and demand. He started with these three Ds which are three important features of India. He said that India is perhaps the only country in the world and uh, I think it is correct also where all the three elements are present. You have a democracy, a functional democracy which is the largest democracy in the world. You have a demography which I said because we have the youngest population in the world and demand which I said was 400 million strong. 
So these three elements, I think as a combination, I think India would be one of the very, very few countries in the world to have all these three elements together. And therefore, it is no wonder that we, we should develop at, at a higher pace than what even we are doing now. Besides governance, transparency, single window clearance for investments coming into India, uh, which, is, which is also very, very important. You should not have too much of a red tape. Uh, so our Prime Minister said we should have red carpet instead of red tape. A red carpet because we need to put on our red carpets for all our uh, foreign uh, investors uh, who are coming into India and do not obstruct them with red tape. Simplification of procedures and quick decision making and people driven social policies. This is an important aspect and I want to tell you that in all our uh, negotiations now in international body, uh, we are giving this emphasis, uh, great emphasis and if this comes up during discussions, I can tell you in greater detail about what this is. Because India's, uh, a good part of India's population is still uh, very poor and uh, there are certain things which cannot be sacrificed in the process of development. So uh, India has to balance very carefully our social policies and how to uh, you know, emerge as a developed power keeping the various attributes of uh, development for international community. So there, there has to be at some point a balance and that is what the present government is uh, striving at. This was a campaign which Prime Minister Modi launched not too long ago, Make in India. Make in India means a uh, call for foreign uh, companies all over the world to come to India and use India as an investment destination to make whatever you can and use Indian market which is large as well as any other market which you wish to go from India. So his campaign was make in India, come and make your product in India. And this was a Swachh Bharat Abhijan which I wanted to tell you also, this is a movement to clean India. This was one of very novel kind of uh, movements which, uh, which uh, Prime Minister Modi embarked on. Biggest ever cleanliness drive he launched on the day Mahatma Gandhi was born. And he said that this is a tribute we are paying, the nation is paying to Mahatma Gandhi's uh, vision of cleanliness. Uh, and he hopes to accomplish absolutely clean India, clean country uh, in five years time by 2019. Of course, every uh, Indian today is conscious of the fact that we, he has a role to play in cleaning his, not only his house, his surroundings, his community. And he has a sense of belonging towards his uh, society by virtue of that being uh, you know, a citizen of a, of a country which is largely embarked on this, on this project. It's a national project uh, we feel of great importance to us. Thus a new India is emerging and uh, Prime Minister Modi has announced already uh, starting 100 smart cities to begin with. What is a smart city? You also have your smart city here. Smart city is an environment friendly city which has uh, all attributes of uh, urbanity, modernity as well as aspects of development all together and uh, with uh, less of pollution, less of uh, um, uh, you know what we have urban day problems, uh, these are smart cities being built up and they are going to have uh, hundreds of smart cities to begin with in various parts of India, which will give a kind of an idea of the future India, what will what is going to come. And therefore, I thank you all. And this is my presentation. I don't know what else to say, but uh, I. Thank you.